Well, thank you very much, Dr. Tabatabai. Well, of course, uh, you know, this is the agronomy department, so I have to begin a seminar with the fish, right? I mean, uh, I don't know where Rick, is, Rick Cruz is, but I'm sure he wouldn't be disappointed. Um, I, I'm not a fisherman. <laughs> well, I used to try to fish, but I'm not, I'm not a fisherman. Um, but in a way, fish is, uh, the, the fish is an interesting uh, starting point for this talk about hormones. And that is because it has been in fish uh, that folks have found some of the effects of the, uh, let's say, extra release of hormones into the environment. I'll tell you about one study, a little bit about one study that was done um, in the Potomac River drainage uh, which is, you know where the Potomac is, it's uh, around Washington, D.C. and in, in Maryland. And um, this study was completed in, I think, 2006 or 2007. The folks who did this study worked for the USGS, and they sampled uh, several watersheds in the Potomac River watershed, several streams in that watershed, and they looked at smallmouth bass. What they were interested in looking at was the potential for um, uh, they, the potential for some fish becoming what is called intersex or having their endocrine systems disrupted in one way or another. And uh, when they did that, they here are some of the results that they found in uh, all of these river systems in their samplings in the summer of 2003, spring of 2004, summer of 2004, they found a number of fish of smallmouth bass that they classified as intersex. What does intersex mean? It means these were male fish that were displaying some features of female fish. And that could mean produ production of eggs. It could mean the production of a protein called um, the telogenin, which is spelled out right here, which is normally a protein that's found only in females. So if the males become more like females, there's a lot of concern about whether these fish are going to be able to reproduce successfully in the future. There's a lot of concern about what kind of behavioral impacts that might have on the fish, because at least with smallmouth bass, it is the males that create the nests where the female lays her eggs. So if the males are becoming more like females, will they create the nests for the females to lay eggs? Well, there's a lot of questions. So um, they also found that the, this, uh, the amount of uh, vitelligenin in the male bass uh, was significant in these uh, watershed, or in these streams, uh, in the fish in these streams as well. Here's another uh, study, kind of along the same line, which describes the collapse, the, really the entire collapse of a fish population of fat, fathead minnows in a lake in Ontario. Um, in this case, the researchers looked at fish in the, in the lake, over a period of years, they had a, um, uh, let's see, this is, let's look at this left graph. This is VTG, which is the vitelogenin concentration, the, the occurrence of vitelogenin. And uh, the lower graph here is um, male fish that were sampled from the lake. The upper graph is female fish that were sampled from the lake. And on the lower axis, I know you can't read it, but the idea is over time they were sampling. These are, this is um, 2003, 2004. During that period, I think it was 2002. I better look at it closely myself. 1999, 2000, 2001, 2003. During that period, uh, they just monitored what the fish were like. And you can see that the concentrations of vitelligenin were higher in the female fish and 
lower in general in the male fish. At this point, they added a synthetic hormone, EE2, to the lake in low concentrations, nanogram per liter qu uh, quantities. And the next time they sampled the fish, they found the VTG concentrations in both the males and the females very high. Then these graphs over here from the same study, and I'm not going to go through all the details here, but basically this left graph is uh, showing a reference lake, and the right graph is showing uh, fish characteristics in the lake that was treated with this synthetic hormone. Here are the 1999 data for fish that they caught uh, who were less than a year old or ages one through four. Here are the 2000, 2001. This is when they added EE2. The next year, they caught essentially no fish who, were, who had ages of less than four years old. 2003, the same. 2004, 2005, the population had collapsed entirely. So the conclusion is what happened to these fish uh, most likely, it was the treatment by the synthetic hormone. Now, this is an example of, uh, no, of a number of studies that have been done all over the world looking at both um, rivers as well as lakes, concentrating on fish and, uh, to some extent, other amphibians studies that have been done in the laboratory and in the field. So uh, these are studies that suggest that their endocrine disrupting chemicals in the environment may have a significant effect on aquatic organisms that live in the environment. Some examples of chemicals that have, uh, that probably have endocrine disrupting capabilities include Atrazine, uh, anti antibiotics like triclosan, which is in all the antib antibacterial soap that you use at home and goes down the drain and, and out to the uh, wastewater treatment plant. Um, nonophenols, which are a common class of surfactants and get into the environment again through wastewater treatment plants and hormones. Uh, estradiol is an example of a hormone. It's uh, a female hormone. There are lots of, of uh, hormones. It's the one that I'm going to focus on for the rest of the talk. Um, because it has a fairly high uh, potency in terms of its endocrine disrupting capability. It's interesting to see how similar the structure is between uh, estradiol, this is E2, and nonophenol, which is uh, a, a common um, surfactant. So, gee, I see that um, the projector is kind of cutting off my titles at the top. I'm sorry about that. Um, endocrine disrupting chemicals are commonly uh, uh, acronymed as EDCs. So EDCs have uh, profound effects on aquatic wildlife. It's not just the um, smallmouth bass. Uh, minnows, uh, turtles uh, have also been shown to be sexually inhibited by very low concentrations of, uh, of hormones like estradiol. Thank you for watching the Agronomist Podcast. YouTube limits video lengths to 10 minutes. You can watch this seminar in its entirety at the Department of Agronomy website, www.agron.iastate.edu.